The German Chancellor meets with US President Joe Biden at the White House. What was on the agenda? Hello, I'm Arnand Maidu and this is The Heat. The German Chancellor Olaf Scholz met with President Biden in Washington on Friday. The meeting took place as both leaders are heavily engaged in supporting Ukraine in its conflict with Russia. For more on the talks, we begin with CGTN's White House correspondent, Nathan King. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz in a really quick visit here to the White House, uh, basically just a couple of hours. It's called a working visit. There's no uh, press conference, just a quick uh, uh, chat as he entered the Oval Office, both outwardly, the U.S. and Germany saying they're on the same page when it comes to uh, the conflict in Ukraine and other matters. Matter of fact, if I'm not mistaken, you were here in February of 2022, uh, and Russia was amassing its troops, uh, 185,000 troops on the Ukrainian border, and uh, we made it clear that if he moved, we would both respond. And together we made good in that promise. I really appreciate the very good cooperation between the two of us, our governments, and the United States, and Germany, and Europe. And the transatlantic partnership is really in a very good shape. Of course, what they say in public is very different to what they say in private. And even though uh, there have been a lot of meetings of mine when it comes to uh, uh, taking on Moscow, uh, there's been deep reservations, and then there's other issues uh, other than Ukraine, especially when it comes to uh, uh, U.S. economic policy. Also, very big differences uh, when it comes to China. In between uh, the two visits of Olaf Scholz, of course, uh, here to the White House was that high-profile visit uh, to Beijing. Uh, Germany wants to continue to do business with China despite the U.S.'s uh, continued economic containment when it comes from everything from tariffs on goods to uh, containment strategy when it comes to uh, cutting off high-end semiconductors. Germany, very lukewarm about this, although there are divisions within uh, the coalition government of Olaf Scholz, uh, very much European uh, viewpoint is very different uh, from the U.S. And the U.S., of course, wants to get allies on board when it comes to uh, uh, competing uh, with China, and that's uh, using diplomatic uh, language. So a lot uh, to talk about here, uh, but very little time. And, you know, questions like Nord Stream 2, the explosion stuff, won't come up, uh, at least in public, because there is no uh, a chance to grill these two presidents uh, from journalists. The other thing to watch is even though that they say they're fully behind Ukraine when it comes to stepping up weapons, there is increasing uh, uh, frustration in the part of domestic audiences, both in Germany and here in the US. And the real question is, what's the off-ramp? Uh, that may be something discussed behind the scenes, but not said publicly. Nathan King, CGTN, with the White House. To discuss all of this, we're joined now from Cambridge, Massachusetts, by Klaus Lauris. He is a visiting scholar for European studies at Harvard University. Joining us too from Beijing is Victor Ga. He is chair professor at Suchow University. With us here in Washington, D.C., is Anton Fedyashin. He is a professor of history at American University. And also joining the discussion is Saurabh Gupta. He is senior Asia-Pacific policy specialist at the Institute for China-America Studies. Welcome to all of you to the show. Klaus Lares, uh, lots of speculation about this visit by Chancellor Schultz to Washington. Uh, as you heard our reporter tell us there, it's called a working visit. These were very quick talks that took place in Washington. But of course, these talks can also take place over the telephone. But Chancellor Schultz felt that he had to fly from Berlin to Washington for this meeting. The New York Times writing about this short visit says it may reflect a growing sense of urgency both in Washington and Europe about how to end this conflict. That's the Russia-Ukraine conflict. What did you make of the meeting? 
Well, it is a short visit. You're quite right. It is a surprise visit, but it also is an important visit. Uh, Scholz and Biden talked three times in January on the telephone, but to see each other eye to eye and to talk to each other personally is, of course, a different matter. And the war in Ukraine, how to continue the war, how to support uh, uh, Ukraine will be the major uh, issue. But of course, Peace talks may also have been on the agenda. Uh, also, the forthcoming NATO summit in the summer uh, may have been uh, uh, considered and talked about. And also, possibly, the role of China in the Ukraine war will have been talked about. There is, as you know, intelligence information, American intelligence information, that China was considering sending arms to, uh, uh, to Russia. And the United States has warned against that. But if that did happen, then I'm sure uh, very soon Severe sanctions would be imposed on China, and the United States would need the Germans to back that and to do the same. And that will have been talked about, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, that issue about China sending arms to Russia, Klaus, there's been not a shred of evidence from either Absolutely. the United States no. or from Germany on this. Uh, in fact, there were conflicting, no there were conflicting no. reports out of Washington because we heard the Secretary of State and the National Security Advisor say, yes, they're going to be sending weapons to Russia, and then President Biden himself said, no, he doesn't believe that. You're quite right. There has been no evidence, but American intelligence has claimed that the Chinese are thinking about it. Mm -hmm. How true that is, we don't know. But in case such a scenario would happen, I'm sure Biden and uh, Schultz talked about uh, possible consequences, a possible joint uh, policy. But of course, we all hope that that will not happen at all. So, Rob Gupta, uh, Politico, the political newspaper, uh, says Chancellor Schultz's visit is a show of solidarity between Europe and the United States, but the newspaper says it comes against the backdrop of a growing strain as the transatlantic alliance works to remain in lockstep while grappling with the fact that the war has no end in sight. What do you make of that? Could this meeting have been about strategies to end the war or possibly strategies to escalate the war? I would say strategies initially perhaps to escalate the war, but I think it's ultimately about strategies to end the war. I think the Western powers are looking for an end to the hostilities by the end of this summer, frankly. And that's why there is an urgency in arming the, arming, uh, the Ukrainians, although not arming them with things like, like airplanes, F-16s, etc. And so the, the goal out here is to give the Ukrainians another chance at, in terms of their right to self-defense to move the front lines. We'll see whether the front lines move at all. And thereafter to come up with something which would lead to a cessation of hostilities. And it's still too premature to talk about peace plans per se. Remember when the last time the conflict ended, all we had was a ceasefire. We had it memorialized in an agreement, the Minsk II agreement. It was passed as a UN Security Council resolution. And frankly, it was Mr. Zelensky who was unable to get the special status that was required in, for Donbass mm -hmm. in, into law. And, 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 and the whole process got scuppered at that point. So it's, it's a complicated state and I, uh, he hefty political decisions to be made in Kyiv, in Washington, in Berlin. And I think Berlin and Washington are trying to get on the same page. And I'm not sure they're there as yet. But I don't think the gaps are, are too large either. Anton Fedyashin, uh, President Biden says the United States will support Ukraine for as long as it takes. Those are his words, for as long as it takes. But of course, that will depend on whether Congress gets on board as well, whether Congress is prepared to continue the supply of money to uh, Ukraine, um, as well as arms going to Ukraine. Uh, I mean, we also have to remember that there's also an election coming up here in the United States in 2024, a presidential election. Uh, Chancellor Schultz faces an election in 2025. That could further complicate how uh, these two countries approach the war. Um, I mean, do you think there is a recognition both in the United States and in, and in Europe right now that there needs to be some kind of off-ramp or off-ramps developed uh, for both sides? Yes, I think there, uh, there is that recognition on it, especially in the United States, given that the election is coming up. And as we all know, the election season these days uh, in the United States starts in the, in the summer before the actual election year. And those months are, are coming around. Um, I think that Joe Biden can certainly claim credit for uh, supporting the Ukrainians 
in uh, stopping the Russians uh, from advancing too far into their ter territory and the government not imploding. But for the average American voter, that matters a lot less than the billions of dollars that are flowing into the Ukrainian economy and into supporting the Ukrainian military. While many Americans consider the simple fact that there are things that are uh, worth investing that money in at home, we may disagree with that. But that's, you know, what matters is what people think on uh, election day and during the months uh, in the run up to the election. What's interesting is that the Europeans are also of course, moving towards um, uh, 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 pressuring, maneuvering, let's put it that way, the Ukrainians towards a uh, peace deal. And it was Rishi Sunak, of all people, and the British have been some of the most pro-Ukrainian during this conflict, um, that has uh, voiced um, the proposals that the, the British, the French, and the Germans made to Zelensky in early February of this year, mm. uh, promising that the, the summer NATO summit will offer to Ukraine military support and certain guarantees. None of that was specified. We'll have to wait till the summer. But in exchange for Zelensky's government considering a peace deal. So from uh, different points in the West, there is definitely a concerted and noticeable movement towards um, encouraging the Ukrainians to settle for a peace because the, the Western economies mm. will not be able to sustain uh, support of Ukraine and the leaders behind those decisions to get reelected. Right, Anton, as far as Western economies not being able to sustain uh, the war continuing, I think it would be fair to say that the European countries are far more vulnerable than the United States. Would it also be fair to say that any ultimate decision on a peace deal would not be up to the Europeans, it would be up to the Americans? Yes, uh, it is fair to say that, because ultimately the United States is by far the most uh, powerful member of the, mm -hmm. the Western uh, alliance and of NATO, of course. So, yes. Um, and, of course, a lot will also depend on the Ukrainians and what the Americans sort of encourage them to do and what guarantees uh, Washington is ready to give Kiev in exchange for what looks like is uh, going to be some kind of territorial uh, settlement. In other words, the Ukrainians give something up in exchange for security guarantees by all sides, but it's going to be a very long-term process. Victor Go, uh, great to have you with us. Victor, I want to get back to these statements that are flying around Washington that China is about to supply Russia with weapons. Uh, Chancellor Scholz has also expressed concerns that China may be considering supplying weapons to Russia. And as I said, they've been very... Uh, conflicting messages coming out of Washington, mixed messages, one side saying yes and the other side saying not so quick. Um, I mean, what do you make of it? And, and isn't this kind of rhetoric, without any evidence whatsoever, actually just serving to increase tensions unnecessarily? First of all, it is shocking to see that some of the uh, American uh, leaders went to such an extreme of accusing what China is thinking about. Now, what I may think about has no legal standing in any uh, real analysis of the situation. And how can the Americans accuse China of what China thinks about? China may think about many, many things, but if you really uh, feel very strong about your accusation, come up with evidence. And there is no evidence at all. That's number one. Number two is that from the Chinese perspective, Russia has capabilities of all kinds in conventional capabilities as well as nuclear capabilities. And this accusation also took place at a time when China is very, very committed to promoting a peace deal for ending the war in Ukraine through diplomacy. Therefore, if you really want to listen to what the Americans are accusing China of what China thinks about, look at what China is really doing. That is to apply all urgency, to call on all the combatant parties to really engage in diplomacy. And I would say, if you look at the meeting between Chancellor Schultz and President Biden, history will mark it that at the moment, the most urgent thing is to end the war as quickly as possible, because you need to prevent about several things. One is the escalation of the war, 
uh, from conventional war into unconventional war, which will be a disaster for mankind as a whole, and then the spilling off of the war from Ukraine to other countries in its vicinity. This is absolutely the most important thing. And the war in Ukraine is fast becoming a proxy war between uh, Russia on the one hand and the United States and NATO, which U.S. controls, using Ukraine as a proxy. Therefore, this is a disaster not only for Ukraine, the Ukrainian people, but also for countries in Europe. And I'm pretty sure that Chancellor Schultz might have talked about what to do with this war. It cannot be protected, it cannot be prolonged forever, because otherwise it drags everyone into this and abyss. Right. And the war, if escalated, will be truly a human disaster for mankind as a whole. China is the only country now producing a viable framework for ending the war in <laughs> peace. I hope more and more countries will understand that and support that. Okay. Klaus Laris, uh, as I said, lots of speculation about what these two leaders talked. But do you think the Nord Stream pipeline, uh, the attack on the Nord Stream pipeline, came up for discussion? It may have come. I've not heard any reports about it before Schultz visited uh, the White House or during his visit. I've not heard that anyone mentioned that that was a topic of conversation. But it probably was, I would say, at least for a few minutes they will have talked about it. But as we know, uh, we don't really know who blew up the pipeline. Uh, we know, we are aware of Seymour Hersh's recent article who accuses the, uh, the United States of having done so. But it is based on just one single source, so that may or may not be true. And I guess the two leaders will not have uh, whispered uh, secrets, top secrets to each other. Mm -hmm. um, just uh, to, to say what Victor uh, just said, to be fair to Olaf Scholz, in his speech to the Bundestag only a few days ago, uh, Olaf Scholz called on China to use his influ its influence on Putin to bring about uh, the, the end of the war, yeah. to withdraw yeah. its forces and to bring a peace settlement. Uh, about. So Scholz uh, actively engages China and would like China to use its influence on Putin. Right, and China did come up with a 12-point peace plan, Klaus. One other point I want to talk about, Klaus, during his visit to Europe uh, last week, uh, President Biden held a closed-door meeting with a group of countries, East European countries, known as the Bucharest Nine. Uh, these are the countries which uh, have uh, borders close to Russia. Uh, and President Biden had to remind the leaders of these countries that the goal of this war was not to topple the Russian government. Um, according to Politico, these countries are calling for, quote, uh, a war to cripple Moscow for good. I mean, is that a huge division between East Europe and West Europe on what happens and how this war ends? Well, I think it's a geographical question. The closer you are to the Russian border, the more worried and concerned you are. And Poland, the Baltic states, they, of course, have often been invaded and divided by Russia. That they are really scared about Russia also right now and into the future is understandable. That doesn't mean one should go over the top and call for the split up of the Russian Federation. And that is not supported by Biden, as you just said. It is not supported by France and certainly also not by the German Chancellor. In the end, after the war, we need to re-engage with Russia. But before that, Russia needs to be uh, withdrawn from and needs to withdraw its forces from Ukraine. Because mm -hmm. we all know Russia is the invader. Russia started it all. Without the invasion, we wouldn't be in that dire situation we are in right now. So the, uh, the, the, the ball is in Putin's court to withdraw his forces and to sue for peace and get to a constructive peace settlement. And then, of course, we should all engage with Russia, particularly in an economic and cultural way again. Anton von Dioschen, do you agree with that uh, uh, assessment that Klaus just gave us there, that uh, this was an unprovoked war, that the ball is in Putin's court, it's up to him. He invaded another country. Right. So uh, Vladimir Putin certainly made the decision uh, just over a year ago to move troops into Ukraine. But the war had already been going on in Ukraine um, uh, that started with the anti-terrorist operation that the government in Kiev 
launched back in the spring of uh, 2014, that began or that resulted um, from the opposition of people in southeast Ukraine to the violent uh, overthrow of a legitimate uh, leader, regardless of how you feel about Viktor Yanukovych, who was overthrown in February of 2014. If I, for example, don't think that he was a particularly good leader at all. Uh -huh. uh, but democratic leaders are elected, and then there's a democratic process to get rid of the bad ones. That, of course, is not what was done. So I think we need to be a lot more careful about assigning uh, uh, blame and question at which stage the Ukraine crisis, which has been around for eight years, really started going off the rails. The invasion of February of last year certainly didn't help to make anything better. But I think that uh, uh, everyone needs to realize that uh, NATO expansion, the regime change experiment in February of 2014, uh, certainly contributed to the general tension in Eastern Europe and to the catastrophe uh, to which we've all come uh, today. So we'll see if there's a realization of this uh, in the in the West. Um, mm -hmm. If there isn't, uh, yeah. Putin has been using uh, the you know the singling out of Russia as the sole perpetrator of the tensions in Europe very ably so far, and it's allowed him to consolidate the Russian people to the point where he can still carry on this war today with a minimum of political damage to himself at home. Sarah Abgupta, if we look at how this war is seen here in the United States, domestic support for Ukraine has fallen from 60% last May to 48% right now, according to an Associated Press NORC poll. Uh, the percentage of Americans who think that Biden has given away too much to the Ukrainians has risen from 7% to 26%. And of course, as we mentioned a moment ago, uh, we are rapidly entering into or, or already in the elections, uh, election cycle. I mean, will these numbers be resonating with the White House? Uh, and if so, what kind of impact could it have on the conflict? Well, up to a point, it will resonate with the White House, but the White House will be watching keenly what the Republicans in Congress are saying on this issue. Uh, at this point of time, the Republicans, th there are differences, obviously, with the White House, but the gaps are not so large to, to, uh, to, to, for, for Mr. Biden to, to really uh, take a completely different tack or a different tack with regard to Ukraine. And so he is trying to manage the politics of the situation also. Uh, but I think at this point of time, there's still a broad consensus behind Mr. Biden's support for Ukraine. And until, unless circumstances change in a in a fairly drastic or dramatic way, I don't cons I don't see that changing in a very significant way either. The Republicans will have hearings; they will poke here and poke there, particularly in terms of how the money is being spent and whether there is corruption back in Ukraine or not with regard to these huge sums. Mm -hmm. But at this point of time, it's early to tell, and I don't think Mr. Biden thinks he is really uh, politic being politically weakened by his support for the Ukrainian cause. It's it's helping him, I think, frankly. Victor Gar, uh, as Klaus told us a moment ago, uh, Chancellor Schultz has called on China to use its influence in Moscow to press for a Russian withdrawal. Uh, from the areas it occupies in Ukraine. And China, of course, has presented its 12-point peace plan. Um, what's the next step for China? Where does China take it to diplomatically from here? I understand China is seriously and very urgently uh, working with both Russia on the one hand and Ukraine on the other hand about its proposed peace plan because China believes this is really the high time to end the war through diplomacy, and no time should be wasted, mainly because of the danger, as I mentioned, about the spilling over the war into other countries and the escalation of the war from conventional into unconventional warfare, which will be a disaster for everyone. Now, I want to emphasize, at this particular time in history, China is the only sizable, impactful country in the world urging for a peace deal between Russia and Ukraine. Now, all the other countries should join this call. If they believe the Chinese proposal is not perfect, come up with a better proposal. That's not a problem. But the choice is not between peace or war, because we now more and more see clearly the consequences of war. Now, in the war in Ukraine, 
the more you push Russia, the more danger there will be of escalation and spilling over the war into other countries. And I think we all need to be very philosophical, very realistic, very pragmatic. Peace is not easy. Peace is not straightforward. But peace will be better than war, especially when we are talking about the possibility of escalation and spilling over of the war. I'm pretty sure Chancellor Schultz and the German government in general, especially the German business communities and the German people at large, know the consequences of war. They suffered the consequences of war before. War is futile in a sense for either party of the war. And I think China is very philosophical. China is very engaged in real efforts promoting peace. And I hope history will realize that China is on the right side of history at this moment, urging for peace and negotiation and diplomacy, rather than pouring more fuel into the war in Ukraine. Therefore, in this context, the false accusation of U.S. leaders against what China is thinking about should really be revealed in greater abundance. China thinks about peace, and China works for peace, and China urges for peace for the people in Ukraine, people in Europe, and people in the world. Uh, Klaus, I'm wondering to what extent uh, does Germany and Chancellor Schulz uh, find themselves in a bit of a difficult situation right here. On the one hand, they would like to see an end to this war. On the other hand, they don't want to be seen to be breaking ranks with the rest of their NATO partners. I mean, we saw the reticence that Germany expressed when it was asked to supply Leopard tanks to Ukraine or uh, get other countries to whom it had sold Leopard tanks to supply those tanks um, to Ukraine. Um, so is this the debate that's taking place in Germany right now? Um. Schultz is in a difficult situation, quite right, and he's a reflective person, and the German population wanted to hear from his, uh, its leader that he thinks deeply about a commitment of tanks to Ukraine or not, and in the end he took his time and he got the United States to go along with their own Abrahams tanks so that the Germans wouldn't just be the only ones delivering Leopard tanks to Ukraine. Yeah. And I think yeah. that was quite a success for uh, Scholz. He wants Western unity in the war and also in other respects. And I think that is one of the reasons why we see him today in Washington to make sure that uh, the Germans and the Americans yeah. and the rest of the NATO alliance is on the same page. So there is a debate taking place clearly and all, everyone wants to have peace and as soon as possible a peace settlement. But in a way, it is relatively easy to get there. If Putin decided to start withdrawing his troops today, then right. tomorrow would have peace talks. It's not very complicated, but mm -hmm. you cannot reward the okay. invader with having uh, uh, maintaining uh, its conquest. Okay, class. Yeah. <laughs> I'm afraid we are going to have to leave it there, Klaus. We have rapidly run out of time. Thank you so much to all of you for being with us. We need to leave it there. I'm Arnold Naidu in Washington, D.C.